but more importantly, have a discussion with you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have lots of interaction between you and the, the panelists that, that are here to talk about testing methods. Not to say that one testing method is better or fantastic and the other is lousy or maybe you should not use them, but to get a better understanding that each test method has its strong points, has certain limitations, and that when you try to do something, that you should pick the, the right test method. And that is why we picked the title, Horses for Courses. Yeah? Not every horse performs in the same course the best way. Not every method is the, the best way in every situation. So you try to get something that makes the most sense um, for the particular application. So what I've asked these four guys to do is to give a very short elevator speech. But as Mike Justison said when the slides came in, either the elevator is going very slow or it's a very tall building. So the presentations might be a little bit longer, but I hope to limit it each person to about five minutes. And what I want to, what I've asked them to do there is to point out what is the method all about, what are the strong points, and what are the limitations, to create a better understanding of those test methods. That's the whole objective. And what we're going to do the first 45 minutes, we're going to talk about load testing, covering two test methods, rapid load testing and uh, high strain dynamic testing, uh, or dynamic testing as it is generally referred to. And then the last 45 minutes, we're going to talk about integrity testing methods, and we're going to cover quite a few methods there as well. First part, as I said, high strain dynamic testing versus uh, rapid load testing. And I've asked two people that uh, you, one of which you probably, if you're from this area, you definitely know, Bert Miner, uh, at my uh, right on the end of the table. Uh, Bert is a practitioner here with long experience, so doesn't require too much of introduction. And Mike Justison, who was with Birmingham for a long time, heavily involved with rapid load testing, and is now a professor at uh, McMaster University uh, in, in Canada. And Mike will start off talking about rapid load testing. <coughs> okay. Thanks very much, Gerald. Uh, and thanks to everyone for sticking around. Uh, I realize that we're sort of between you and the end, so uh, I'm going to try and make the elevator go very quickly. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about rapid load testing. What is this word rapid? Uh, and why do we use it? Well, when this type of load testing came on the scene, there was already something called dynamic load testing, and it has a very specific meaning. And rapid load testing was something very different. So we needed a different word. So it's not static testing, it's not dynamic testing, it was something else. And it was actually the Japanese that gave us the word rapid. It came from the Japanese Geotechnical Society in the late 1990s. But as you can see on this first slide, rapid load testing has its origins back in the late 1980s. Just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. There's really two ways that we do rapid load testing. We can use uh, pyrotechnics uh, or gas pressure to produce a... Uh, a, what we call a rapid load test, or we can do a cushion drop mass. And if you, if you uh, don't look at the slide for a second, if you look at me, the best way to describe a rapid load test is really, I think, a push load. Right? So if you think about pushing on a foundation, that's about it. Right? A, a rapid load test is really a push. The ASTM calls it a, uh, it's piles under axial compressive force pulse which is a little bit wordy. Uh, I like to really think of it as a push. Uh, I'll talk briefly also about how we um, sort of conceptualize the test and simplify a model uh, to facilitate the analysis, and then quickly talk about some advantages and disadvantages. So what you see in this slide on the left, you see something called the stat rapid test. This is used in, uh, in Europe, and it is a cushioned drop weight, and that's how that, that push load is created by dropping a mass and cushioning the blow. And um, on the right-hand side, you see a picture of the statinamic test. And the statinamic test is the method that uses the uh, pyrotechnics to push a reaction mass up to generate an equal and opposite force down. And at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the uh, reference to the ASTM uh, D7383 and that was published first in 2008. So this is a slide that will recur in some of the other talks, and it's a good way to visualize the different types of load testing for foundations. So that what you see at the top is 
a static load test, let's say, in concept. And all of these tests use mass. When we do a static load test, we kind of uh, call it weight. Well, really, it's just mass under the acceleration of gravity. And that's, we can use that sort of for as long as we want to produce what we call a static load. Uh, in contrast, you can see dynamic testing shown as a much smaller mass, something on the order of 1 to 2 percent of the mass of a static test that's dropped and impacts the foundation, but because of the very rapid accelerations, I shouldn't use the word rapid, very fast accelerations, you can produce the same peak force in the static test with only 1 to 2 percent of the mass. Well, rapid load testing falls somewhere in between. So this type of push loading on a foundation, we're using somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of the mass that we would use in a, uh, an equivalent peak load static test. And we can do it either with the gas pressure by pushing the mass up, or we can do it with some type of soft cushioning by cushioning the weight when it falls down. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the word unloading point method, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. And that's really the, the method that was conceived first by Peter Middendorp from uh, the Netherlands on how we can quantify damping in these rapid load tests in order to sort of almost directly calculate the stiffness of the foundation. So the idea in a rapid load test, this push load, is that we can create a loading event that's long enough that we can actually kind of ignore stress waves. So you, what you'll hear in the next talk is um, a little bit about wave me mechanics and stress wave movement through a pile. In a rapid load test, we're trying to load the pile somewhere in at least 10 or 20 times the duration of the natural period of a pile. So we have this push load, and if we do that, we can sort of conceptualize the test as uh, a basic single degree of freedom system. So what's shown in this slide is a basic uh, force in equilibrium with the inertia of a mass, the stiffness of a spring, and then the damping of a dash pod. And in rapid load testing, we measure that applied force with a load cell. We can measure or very easily deduce the, the mass of a foundation. Uh, we'll use the unloading point method that I mentioned in the previous slide to calculate the damping constant. And um, what we're really looking for is the stiffness. And I like to use a bit of a structural analogy for people. I know everyone, you know, in their in their education, they may have encountered static analysis. Well, on the left-hand side, we see a force in equilibrium with stiffness of a structure. Well, all we do in statinamic is we say, well, we're just going to look at it from a simple dynamics point of view, where now the force is in equilibrium with inertia and damping, in addition to the, stat the static stiffness. What it looks like in the time domain, um, the sort of smooth, larger curve, right, so this one right here, that's measured by the load cell, uh, that's the force sort of in the, the single degree of freedom system. And then you can see a typical relative magnitude, let's say, of the inertia and the damping forces. And then if you subtract the inertia and damping forces from the measured force, back in the equation, I can't seem to go back. Hold on one second. Well, it, uh, basic equation F equals MA plus CV plus K U, I can subtract uh, inertia and damping from the force and get stiffness. And if I look at it in the same sort of quadrant, well, I think the computer crashed. That's why I can't do anything. Oh, I, I broke it. Oh, there you go. So what did you do? I just brought the mouse back off. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I went off the mouse pad. <laughs> so which one have you won? Oh, okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so so basically what we're what we're going for is we've looked back at that regular quadrant that we're used to looking at load tests, static load tests in where we have applied load sort of horizontally and then downward displacement vertically. Um, that sort of smooth curve is what we'll measure with the load cell and measure with usually an optical displacement sensor or sometimes with an accelerometer. Uh, so we see that kind of smooth curve. 
Once we subtract the effect of inertia and damping, we end up with a, a curve that's shaped much more like a conventional static load test. And we call that, in rapid load testing, we call that the derived static curve. So advantages, for the most part, um, we view the tests in either the statinamic or the stat rapid or any of the versions of rapid load testing. Um, I'll, I'll use the word reliable, and I'll say reliable, let's say, in the sense that what we measure is measured reasonably well. So we're directly measuring things that we want to know, like force and like displacement. Um, and in that sense, we can show the results in direct comparison to a static load test result. We have to understand we have inertia and damping, but for the most part, we can sort of conceptualize it and understand it physically in the same way. And the analysis is quite simple. So over the years, there have been refinements on this basic um, sort of analysis method of single degree of freedom system that can be quantized into different sections. Um, but for the most part, the analysis is quite simple. Generally costs less than static testing. Uh, it's quick and easy. If you were here yesterday, yesterday morning, there was a presentation uh, on statinamic testing that was done here in Seattle. I believe there were six tests, somewhere around 2,000 tons was the test load, and uh, I believe they did sort of one test a day, which is uh, uh, pretty good. And I, in particular, and I think this was shown in the presentation yesterday, um, this test method has particular advantages in overwater situations. You can easily repeat the tests, um, so you can come along after foundations have been installed and randomly select a, a foundation and do a rapid load test on it. There doesn't need to be any special consideration during the construction of, a, of the test pile. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, it's not on the slide, but if you do have irregularly shaped piles, uh, then the rapid load test is perfectly suitable for those piles that doesn't present any uh, challenges. Um, and it can be a good alternative to dyna dynamic testing when maybe dynamic testing may risk some structural damage to the pile. And rapid testing in many ways had its motivation or its origins in testing drilled shafts or other types of cast in place piles, but it is also equally applicable to uh, driven piles. Um, the other thing about uh, capacity, and that is if you think about energy, we're we're actually delivering more energy in a rapid test than you are in a dynamic test. And we stand a better chance of, let's say, fully mobilizing the ultimate geotechnical capacity of a foundation the more energy we use. And another thing I listed here as an advantage is that um, uh, some types of rapid load tests can also be done as uh, lateral load tests. Some of the disadvantages. Um, Sometimes we have to be careful in interpreting the test results because it is a, a fairly quick test. Remember, we're just doing this, and you can imagine, you know, if you're if you're up on your your um, soil mechanics, there's not time for excess pore pressures to dissipate. So when we test on cohesive soils, we have to be a little bit conservative sometimes uh, in interpreting the test results, um, and it does cost more than dynamic testing. Okay, so that's about as fast as I can go. Thank you. So, okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. We now go to the second test method, high strain dynamic testing, and Bert Miner will give his part of the story. <clears throat> just click on there. And then you see from the well, how about I just use these arrows? I won't I use the cursor, I'll be too okay. shaky. So uh, a lot of the presentations here already have, have had uh, explicit or implicit evidence that there's dynamic testing, and I think a whole lot of you know uh, a lot about dynamic testing, so it's a uh, uh, don't be too hard on me if I give a very quick elevator speech on it. I'm sure I'm going to leave something out that's close to your heart. Um, it's founded on a very, uh, some pretty, very fundamental and elegant mathematics, I think, and, and go back to the 1700s. Uh, French mathematician formulated the, the uh, wave, wave mechanics and wave propagation for a long, slender rod. And then we could, if we fast forward, I guess we had, uh, in a previous session, we had a slide showing of the history of some of the different instrumentation and methodologies. But I'm going to fast forward up to the 1950s when um, uh, E.A. Smith uh, did the first wave equation analysis, which is kind of a cousin to, to this whole thing. And um, on the slide here, you see 1972 to 
2019, so 1972 is when, uh, at least in the States, there's a, a commercially available um, equipment and a, and a niche group of people who specialize in that. And then since then, it's become quite pervasive as we have seen today. Um, so we know that there's a wave that goes down the pile, and this slide neglects the upward traveling wave. But if we ha as we have that happen, we can make force and velocity measurements. And I'm going to call those dynamic measurements. <clears throat> we generally look at those in terms of uh, a force and velocity. And uh, from some simple arithmetic, we can separate from the, from the force and velocity. We can get the, the nature of the, the wave down and the wave up. We take those dynamic measurements and we go to what we call case method results. And uh, I guess other, some other manufacturers might call them something different, although I think maybe they, everybody calls it case method. And from the case method, um, we're going to get uh, those, from those measurements, we can have hammer energy and information about driving stresses and pile integrity and also a field calculation of bearing capacity. This slide and that, that little, those little bullets there indicate that I'm not here talking just about low testing. Dynamic testing, as I see it, or high strain dynamic testing, is a is a is a bigger package, and so it's it differentiates from a little bit from the way we formulated this, and that it's not uh, just it's not just establishing a geotechnical capacity. There's other things we get out of it. So we have the wave that goes down, and we also have the wave that goes up. Repeating that. And we can um, figure that the, the relationship between the upward and the downward traveling wave depends upon the thing we hit, that's the pile, and we generally know details about the pile, and it depends also on uh, what that wave encounters, and that's the soil, and that's pretty much an unknown. Or if, if we're now we're moving to the load testing part, that's the unknown. And we can take the wave up and the wave down, and we can post-process it, or what we call signal matching. Uh, there are the one of the proprietary programs is CAPWAP, and uh, we post-process it, and we take that wave down as an excitation to the to an to a model of the pile and a model of the soil. The soil model is a guess, and uh, we can then adjust that model until the excitation with the downward traveling wave gives us an upward traveling wave and compare that with the upward traveling wave we actually measured, all the measurements at the top. And it won't agree because the model is wrong. And so you iterate until you get a good match between the, um, the measured upward traveling wave and the computed one after you've excited the pile with the, with the, the measured downward wave. And the primary characteristic that we're looking for is the uh, is the soil resistance, and that analysis, that final signal match, gives us the soil resistance that we've activated or calculated a calculation of the soil resistance that was actually activated by that particular hammer blow. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm seeing we get out of dynamic testing. Um, well, so what's what are the uh, what's the single biggest uh, benefit? I can't really. Re remember what I wrote in there because there's so many of them. Um, but uh, I think we're saying there that, uh, that from that suite of case method information, we get a very robust set of data that helps us to characterize what really happened and how we, what we did to achieve, um, to achieve the static load that we, or the, the calculated soil resistance we got out of the CAPWAP. And uh, all of those results integrate fairly well with what we normally do on pile driving sites for inspection. We, we, we can, we're concerned on pile driving sites with what's the hammer performance. We have a saxometer and a stroke, or we have transfer energy. We're concerned with driving stresses because sometimes they, those may be the, a limiting factor. Um, and so I guess my point there is that, is that we, what we get out of this integrates very, very well with, with all the other techniques that are conventionally impl uh, implemented on a construction site for, for pile driving. And um, have I only used 20, we're 25 minutes, but that's yeah. how many, how no, much, don't, don't worry about don't it. Work. Okay. Um, well, did I, was I talking a slide ahead? Well, so there's our, oh, no, this is the bottom of my slide, sorry. 
Um, so I want to give an example of that. So, so let's say we have a, a, a test pile program where we go out and we make measurements during, during driving and then during restrike. Well, we're going to have transfer energy and driving stress from the driving, and then we're going to have from the restrike, we're going to know how much soil setup there would be, and, uh, and so we can then move to um, establish, well, if we, know how, if we know what load we want and we know how much setup we're going to have, we can kind of back calculate what's the target end to drive resistance. We could take that to wave equation. We have some hammer calibration information. And because the tests are relatively quick and relatively cheap, we might have done a good job of characterizing site variability. And uh, we can, we're, when we're taking it to wave equation to kind of rationalize it, we can consider a, a variety of different RUs. We can consider driving stresses and whether that limits it. And so, again, that's how it, how it, it integrates very robustly with everything else that you're doing on site for your construction control. Well, what's the, what's the limitation? I think the limitation is intimately connected with the fact that it's part of what we do in the field. So if we do things in the field, like bringing a hammer that's too small, then we're not going to be able to mobilize all the resistance. So its very strength, which is that it's integrated with the pile driving activity, is also its Achilles heel. Um, what have I got here? For example, as I've already mentioned, we bring a hammer out that's big enough to drive the pile. It might not be big enough to restrike the pile. So the contractor knows from experience that a D62 will drive the piles, but I have to say that if you want to restrike it and verify that, then you need a D80, Steve, or a D180. <clears throat> and Steve, by the way, you asked yesterday whether, well, you asked how much for a show of hands on contractors and engineers, and I thought you were both. Okay, all right. So another, uh, another limitation of it, which comes from this inter practical integration, is that uh, you, you don't always get as long as you want for the restrikes. And Catherine Fiedek mentioned that this morning at the job in Pelican, they had three days on their restrike. And uh, I think you said, was it 30 days they had on the static load test and three days on the restrike? So we see, you see that tension. So there we are. That's my very quick elevator speech on the strengths and limitations. Thank you. Okay, now it's up to you. Um, because the next slide shows hopefully what we're going to do is have a discussion uh, with, with you. Uh, your opportunity to ask whatever questions uh, you want to ask about these test methods. Uh, anything that you would like to know. And if there's nothing coming from you, then as moderator, I will make sure that I'll have some questions as well. But hopefully there are plenty of questions from the floor. Before you start doing that, please walk up to a microphone. The session is being recorded so that it can be posted uh, for those of uh, people that already left Superpile in advance. Uh, and if you don't talk in the microphone, it's going to be hard to capture your voice. So please walk up to the microphone uh, if you want to ask any question. But to get it started off then, uh, let's start with, uh, with Mike. Uh, the design engineer is interested in this, this magic number, uh, the capacitor. Um, with your rapid load test, can you provide that information? Or are there issues there that, that makes it a little bit more complex? Okay, is that on? Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah, I have to go close. Okay. Um, that's about a million dollar question. So uh, I think if anyone was here and listened to Sam Pikowski yesterday, the the idea of this magic number of capacity is um, it's a pretty nebulous idea, I suppose. I would say that um, the rapid load testing is maybe no better or worse at determining that magic number than any other test, depending on the situation. I mean, if you want to go back to horses for courses, now that I know what that means, um, I'd say it, it depends. It really depends. Um, so um, the, the good thing about rapid load testing, I think, for most engineers is that you get to see the measured signals in the same quadrant on the graph. You can see the load, you can see the movement, uh, you can see the effect of removing the dynamic forces. So then uh, whatever method you might use for determining capacity of a static load test, you could apply to the results of a rapid load test, but also with some appropriate judgment. So, um, I mean, 
I would say yes, we can certainly give rapid load testing can give a magic number for capacity, but what capacity actually is, I think, is a bigger question. Okay. Bert, same question for you. Can your high strain dynamic test can it provide the magic number? Well, if, if I were if I were on the job site and I had a number in my head, that I'd probably wait. I wouldn't formulate my answer until I said, "Well, what do you need?" But uh, but that that then I would depend on how I answered the question. Maybe not my number wouldn't change, but the way I posed it might. So um, if you said, "Well," Uh, I need a high number and I wasn't there, I'd say, uh, well, let's do a restrike. So the question is, the, what, what's the magic number really? Just like Mike said, there's a whole lot of context in it. Um, we just did a job in, in Alaska for, for a client there and um, the magic number was too low. And um, so we tested every, all, all, what were there, eight piles in that fence, Andy? And so then we had a different uh, resistance factor, and so we needed a different magic number. So the context is different. So it, it, I, I totally agree. It's hard to it's hard to say. Can you provide a magic number? Um, but in another way, in another sense, to avoid sidestepping the question uh, like that, I would say that um, if we think of the magic number as being a typical pile with Davidson's failure criteria, well then I think we can typically give the answer and I can sleep at night. Sure. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, please, then. So I'm uh, interested to hear what uh, Bob has to say because about this topic, because you drive a lot of uh, large diameter pipe piles here in the Northwest, open-ended. And a large diameter pipe pile going open-ended deep into the soil, when you're driving it, cookie cuts. So upon a hammer blow, you're going to see resistance in friction along the side of the pile and on the inside of the pile, perhaps, or at least for some distance. And, but at the same time, there may be some participation of the soil plug on the inside of the pile and that mass contributing to resistance or perhaps contributing to the side resistance. But then, if you were to perform a static test, it's conceivable that the soil could form more of a plug. In, in other words, it would behave very differently because of the inertial resistance of the soil on the inside of the pipe. And so I'm curious as to how you go about handling that and what, you know, I'm, I'm, to me it seems like it's a fundamental limitation of any kind of dynamic test on a large open-ended pipe pile, but the capacity of those things are so big, you're sort of stuck with not a lot of alternatives. Well, so a couple things rolling around in my head. I, I actually think sometimes that the, the plugging or the, that inter, internal uh, issue is potentially more severe with a pile that really is going to plug. Um, that it, that's smaller and it's, and it's surely going to plug. I think that the correlation uh, we have we don't have that many static load tests with with those big piles, but I don't think I see any any. Uh, departure from the general reasonable correlation and one that comes to my mind again is another one with Shannon Wilson and Catherine Fiedek which was done in Catherine how big was that pile at Fort Mann was uh, that was like uh, I'm gonna guess that was a six-foot pile and um, they mobilized the was that the D225 oh the make 500 for restrike yeah so we had a, a pretty reasonable correlation, um, but I think in that case we got our correlation from using end of drive, uh, end of drive end bearing and restrike friction, and that's. So I, I would say that, you know, I, I don't know physic, I don't know much what the, what's actually happening down there. When we drop when we drop tapes down in it, they very rarely plug. You know the, uh, you know, 
what, in, during a restrike, occasionally you get measurements before and after a restrike, and the soil level inside doesn't move even though the pile does. So I don't know what, what the mechanics are down there, but I have to kind of default to the, to the correlations we have, and they seem to be pretty, pretty good, and I, it's not uncommon for me to add end to drive end bearing to restrike friction, and, um, and, that's how, and, and that gives me a pretty good correlation. What about rapid load testing and open-ended pipe piles? Issues? Well, again, I, I think there's still the same problem of not a lot of comparative data, but um, probably like you would answer most questions when you compare, let's say, the static behavior of a pile and the dynamic behavior of a pile, the rapid load testing would probably lie somewhere in between. Um, but I think one of the things that Bert said that was very uh, good is that also the diameter is a big factor and I think that these, the larger diameter piles are probably much less prone to actual plugging phenomena than the smaller piles that are that are driven open end. But um, um, it's just one of those things that you have to have the right amount of experience and judgment on as a, as a load tester, whether okay. it's rapid or static or dynamic. Already, what came up was as we go to, to larger piles, whether it's a larger open-ended pipe pile or a larger diameter concrete pile, uh, the presentations that we've heard in the last day and a half have pointed time and time again to larger foundations. Bert, let's start with you. As the, the pile get bigger, uh, whether it's concrete or steel, are you getting more challenged trying to perform your high strain dynamic testing in a safe and uh, good manner, or is it really uh, not not an issue? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is maybe it's not the best answer. I maybe didn't do my homework if you that if I knew that question was coming. So the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, if they're expensive piles, and that's the large steel piles, frequently they don't have any extra length, and so we're chasing our sensors up near the top of the pile in order to keep them out of the water or the template. And so then that becomes an eight channel. You know, we're, we're, we're putting more sensors on such a pile. Um, and um, no, I, I, don't, I don't really see that much in the way of scale effects, frankly. Okay. Rapid load testing, scale effects issues with larger diameter piles? So higher capacity? Higher, higher capacity. capacity so um, I don't think there are any scale related effects and um, all of the rapid load testing technology is perfectly scalable to any size anyone wants to do, but it becomes a question of money. And um, you, know, you would need to invest in the equipment to do very, very large load tests, and then you would need to know that you're going to get the return on that. So, so if you want to do you know, giant load tests, you need to know there's a market for that before you build the equipment. So I mean, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg Sort of thing, mm -hmm. but, um, but in terms of scalability, the technology is perfectly scalable to any size anyone wants. Okay, I, I want to add to my sure. answer. Um, large piles that are surely displacement piles; th those are those can become a problem because we can't. It, we need larger displacements to mobilize the end bearing. So yeah, that's that's you know. If I, I saw that there was a presentation earlier today about a 36-inch square pile, and I'm thinking that's awful hard to mobilize that end bearing. And um, because it's so it's so compliant, it takes so much movement um, to move that. And so I can see myself with it feeling um, conservative on a large diameter pile that's surely displacement, surely plugged, or or a solid pile. But you mobilize it on the initial drive, you knock it, so that would be perfect. Microphone. Good point. It seems, it seems like to me, uh, there would be the perfect case for using the superposition that you talked about where you add end of initial drive in bearing to beginning of restrike. I see that we drove some 36 inch square piles in Pensacola Bay, Skanska did. And it was an interesting problem because on doing restrikes, the soil I'm not sure what it had a mica in it or something. It was a sandy soil. It was kind of bouncy. And you could see, upon doing restrike blows, 
by the third blow, the side resistance was going away. And you were mobilizing an increased amount of end bearing with each subsequent blow. And by the time you got to the tenth restrike blow, you were starting to see more end bearing because you'd moved the pile a little farther. But by then, the side resistance was greatly diminished from what it was on the second or third blow. So you could never really mobilize all of the resistance at the same time in the same blow. So to me, that was the perfect case of using superposition. But guess what? Florida DOT said no because it was a design-build job and they just were pushing back at the contractor. And to them, they were looking for, you said it, the magic number. And the magic number required some engineering judgment and interpretation. And they wanted a magic number that was not subject to interpretation. And so it became a squabble. But, you know, to your point there, moving the pile enough to mobilize end bearing on a large displacement pile like that presents some challenges that have to be addressed intelligently and rationally. I think sometimes even at the end of drive, we're advancing the pile a little bit by hysteresis and not by plastic failure. So the difference in the loading and unloading stiffness doesn't allow us, even though the pile's going down a little bit, it's not going down, it's not going into failure, it's just the difference in unloading and loading. Go ahead. I'll add one thing on that. Nobody was using residual stress analysis, so there was a poke at Florida. Yeah. So we don't really know what was the stress in the pile, we were just assuming we were starting at zero, which we know isn't right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's see if I can throw a grenade in the room and walk away. So there are, in both rapid testing and dynamic load testing, there's some signal matching or some interpretation to get to the quasi-dynamic or dynamic parameters like damping. So I'd like to see both of your takes on that portion of the analysis. Now, with dynamic testing and cap lap, you've got soil strata, so you have an idea of what the soil stratigraphy is, or at least I hope you do, and the selection of the damping parameters are local. So the influence of each selection might be somewhat reduced, but in the rapid testing, you've got one damping factor that represents potentially the entire, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So how do we feel about these possibilities to get to that magic number? Do we feel that one number is more or less reliable in the case of the rapid load test, or are we heartened by banking on local variations that we can match individually to obtain a good signal matching? What are the pitfalls or advantages or opportunities in these different interpretation approaches? Mike? Okay, so, I mean, damping is always the big question in just about every engineering system. And one of the really robust things, I think, about analysis of rapid load testing is that we were using the test itself to determine, let's call it a first estimate of a damping value. So if you think about that equation of motion, when something moves down and then moves back up again, there's a point in time where it's actually stopped. So where the velocity is zero, so in just basic damping sort of theory, we can say the damping is zero. So we can take that point where the damping in the equation is zero. We know what the inertia is, and we know what the measured force is, so we have the stiffness. So at that one point in time, we have sort of a static stiffness. Now what you do is you say, well, let's just assume that that static stiffness stays about the same for a certain range of values throughout close to the point where the pile sort of just stopped and just started to come back. And you can solve for a value of C. So you solve the equation over a range of maybe 100 data points in the data set for a value of C. And you can see the value of C change slightly, but you can also just give it a nice sort of say, well, it looks like it's about this, and then use that number. And I think it's a good number because it's coming directly from the test. It's not something that you're guessing based on the soil type. It's an actual number that you've obtained from the test itself. That's the 
that's the unloading point method. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, and it doesn't end there, but I'll, I've talked enough, so maybe let First, anything you want to add? Well, I'm not sure I followed all the subtleties of your question, Armin, but um, but I, I kind of I kind of thought maybe you were getting at the uniqueness uniqueness of a solution. So you do a, uh, you signal match, and and uh, did you get the same magic number as somebody else doing a signal match? Is that kind of part of your question? Local meaning uh, to a certain part in the pile, or local meaning uh, I know Puget Sound. I see. And so you're. I guess I'm still not understanding your question. Okay, let's let's uh, slightly move it to what you were already pointing out. Of uh, we thought you were asking about the unique uh, answer of an analysis. Let's focus on that. Now. Obviously, since uh, signal matching does not have enough equations, there is a subjective element in there. Um, how, how, how would you, uh, is it a concern? Is it something you can overcome? How do you feel about it? Well, I have to, I have to just kind of answer from my own experience because it's, it, it, that's all you can go on. And so 10 years ago, I hired, uh, hired Andy over there. And after a few years, when I reviewed his cap waps, he was getting about the same thing that I was. And, um, and and that doesn't and that doesn't I think that reflects more more about the method than it than it does about the fact that that I was influential in his training because I don't think I really was all that influential in those particular aspects and that takes me back then to very early uh, was in the 80s I think um, Bank Millennia sent out four different data sets to 20 people and um, and the Results he got back were that, uh, for the most part, the total, you know, the the, the ultimate load was pretty tightly, um, tightly constrained among most of the participants in the study. The uh, if you broke out friction from end bearing, there was a little more scatter, and if you began to look at the at the quakes and the damping, there was a, there was a significant amount of scatter. But the ultimate capacities were pretty similar among the majority of the experienced users, and that's rung true to um, to my experience both with 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 Andy and when I used to work with you know with another company and um, so I, I would say that they that they are within reason they're it's pretty repeatable among people who are using good data competently Mike subjective elements on the analysis of uh, rapid load testing an issue um, I would say it's a very minor issue uh, for the most part, um, for the most part, if you have a result that doesn't seem to make sense, you can go back to, let's say, the pile installation record, and maybe if, if there was a huge overpour of concrete or something like that, and the mass may not be what you think it is, uh, but that's really the, you know, the responsibility of the people doing the test to investigate and collect all of the information, um, you know. But in terms of the unloading point method of analysis itself. Uh, that's even automated, uh, you know, by software. So it's, there's very, very little subjectivity okay. to that test method. Any more questions from the floor? <laughs> yes, ma'am. In my experience, uh, dynamic testing, and what I've seen of rapid load testing, but it tends to underpredict when compared to static load testing. And some of this with dynamic testing related to hammer mobilization and whatnot. But there are some cases, case histories, where these methods have over-predicted the resistance. Do you guys have any comments about that? Bert? Thanks, Catherine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm sure I've over-predicted things before. Um, I don't have a methodical, you know, I don't have a, I honestly don't have a, a methodical answer to that, or I guess we would probably be beginning to weed it out. Uh, I think the very worst case I ever had was in Vancouver, where um, I actually, it was the very early days with CAPWAP automatic matching, and, um, and CAPWAP gave a low number, or the automatic matching and CAPWAP gave a low number, and I thought, I'm smarter than Frank. 
automatic analysis, and I went in and I, I the damping was huge, and I went in and overruled the cap wap, and and I was wrong, and uh, so that's my worst case. I, I think I was off by two and a half. Over prediction on rapid load testing. Yeah, so I think what, what I mentioned before, when um, when you're testing in cohesive soils, and we don't have time for excess pore pressures to dissipate. Um, you're in a very undrained condition. And if you don't have a, a large displacement where you can completely mobilize the ultimate geotechnical capacity, whatever that is, of the foundation, you're sort of more in that elastic range. You don't really know for sure if you're in sort of a temporary elastic zone due to, you know, excess pore pressures. Um, or if that's truly the, let's say, straight line stiffness of the foundation. So, um, you know, for those reasons, historically, if you've got piles in clay, you use some conservative reduction factor, which also tends to maybe give some underpredicting sometimes. But, um, you know, I think, uh, it, again, it comes back to the experience and the judgment. Uh, whoever the tester is, you really have to, to just be knowledgeable about the test, uh, but it is possible to overpredict with rapid load testing. It's possible. Gray, you want to add something to that? Yes, I do. Um, we use the term overpredict. You assume that you actually have the right answer somewhere in that ratio. <laughs> and the static load test. So that's where I'm going. Uh, I've seen static load tests overpredict capacity because they were run incorrectly, and they assumed they could use a quick test. And in fact, there was far too much clay in the material to be using a quick test. And so their results were much higher than would have been expected for those circumstances. So it's, uh, I've seen static load tests under predict drastically but just because of the installation method of their of the reaction piles, cookie cut all of the soil around it. So it pulled a plug of soil out of the earth instead of pushing the pile in. And so the static load test can be just as wrong. And actually, I think I've seen more of them run wrong than correctly. So it's very scary to think that the static load test is the Cadillac of tests when, in fact, they seem to be run so poorly, uh, unfortunately. OK. One final question. Can I add something to that? Like, I, I, okay. I, okay. So okay. I, I know you, it's just integrity questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just, still important. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you think about it, most lab tests, on soil, I mean, think about you know a soil you test, and the soil will have some peak strength, and then it'll have some residual strength. You know, you go to a peak, and then at larger strains, you see you know a reduction. Well, I mean, the same is true when we test piles. We're not really testing piles; we're testing soil. So, if you don't have a large strain, um, then you can say, well, you've overpredicted the ultimate geotechnical capacity. But you would do exactly the same on a lab test on any soil if you didn't run it to a large strain. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Mike, you were sending there, so I'll give you the last question, hopefully a short answer, and then we we'll go to integrity testing. No. To Catherine's question, uh, we typically do our restrikes with diesel hammers. And so we hit them with a series of blows in a high capacity file where you can pretty much if you track that and did a series of cap webs, you would see that the skin friction is going away as you're hitting it before you fully mobilize the resistance at the bottom of the pile. Certainly in my area where we have, have uh, sensitive plays, that occurs often. And so when I go into a region where I don't know anything about what's going on, what I usually recommend, although I don't always get that followed through with, is that we do what we call a test pile that's going to be un loaded under static loading conditions that we drive next to it, a companion pile, that's going to be restruck at about the same time if we can get both of those acts together. And so what you tend to find is that if you were to do the gold standard static test, as Gray's mentioning, first, you actually load the soils, you shear the, the surface, and you end up lowering the friction and perhaps increasing the end bearing in the course of that load test. But if you restruck that pile before you load tested it, it would be a damaged skin friction in the, in the time frame that would, may not come back because, of course, the pore pressures behave differently from the restrike condition to the driving condition. And so you get two completely different answers 
you have to be really careful about how you do your testing. And so when we do that with a, a, a sensitive uh, agency, oh yeah, they love the gold center of the static load test because that's what the geotechs all count on. But you want to do apples to apples if you can with both of them. And usually we don't have an overshoot problem if you get the conditions of the soils from the dynamic test to best resemble the conditions of the soils from the static test. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and with that, I want to move or shift, uh, as you already see on the screen, to integrity testing. Because when we talk about testing and evaluation, testing of foundations, uh, you have definitely the load testing, but the integrity testing is at least as important. And what you see on there, what we're going to talk about today are a number of different integrity testing methods. Uh, and to illustrate again, this horses for courses concept, that if you pick the right uh, test method for your purpose, it is important, as you put in this, this table here, that you figure out what is it that you really are after. Now, what output uh, do you, uh, would you like to, uh, to get more information on? And then you have a number of different uh, parameters, different test methods, and they obviously come up with different results. Starting about talking about that, we'll first talk about, oh, go one too far. Uh, Bernie is going to talk about uh, three of those methods, impulse echo, uh, cross-hole sonic, and only because we're in the West Coast, uh, gamma gamma, uh, even though I think it is a very regionally applied uh, test method, but Bernie will talk more about it. Well, thank you all for staying this late. I appreciate that. Um, as has been said already, understanding the capabilities and limitations of the methods is essential because if you apply the wrong method for the information you're seeking, the answer is at best going to be inconclusive and can sometimes be downright misleading. So it's important that the specifier of the method understands the capabilities and the limitations before uh, jumping in, as it were. So we'll go to the impulse echo method, which was one of the earliest of the non-destructive testing techniques. Uh, very simple in principle, in that we have a motion sensor attached to the top of the pile, and we tap it with a hammer. The hammer is typically fairly small, so two, three pounds, something like that. Generates a stress wave that travels down the shaft and gets reflected back from a changing conditions, like the end of the shaft or a crack or some other uh, problem. Um, the issue becomes that we're not measuring what we want to know. We're only measuring time. The only, the only information we get out of this test is that it took X number of microseconds or milliseconds for this wave to travel down and get reflected back. If we make an assumption about the velocity of the wave in the concrete or the material of the shaft, then we can calculate or estimate the depth from which it was reflected. On the other hand, when this method was developed, it was for precast piles in uniform soils. So you know you've driven a 50-foot shaft. So if you go on there and tap it and you get the wrong answer, you've broken the shaft. So it, it was used as a fairly simple integrity test on that basis. It's very fast and economical, but it only measures time and it's not good in complex soils or variable cross-section because each change will return a reflection. So you can end up with a very complicated wiggly line on a piece of paper and you're trying to find one particular bump which tells you, you know, where the toe is. It also has a limited penetration depth because of the side friction on the shaft, the energy gets dissipated as it travels down. And typically in a medium stiff clay, you won't see more than about 35 diameters. So if you've got a one foot shaft 60 feet long, you are probably not going to see a reflection from the bottom of it. Now to answer, to look at that issue there, um, and it's, attempts have been made to try and enhance the response from the bottom of the shaft. We've got a heavily damped uh, pile, no discernible reflection from the toe. So basically you've got no information unless you believe in no news is good news because you can say, well, at least the top 35 diameters must be good because I'm not seeing anything. But uh, engineers don't usually get a warm, fuzzy feeling from that kind of analysis. Um, what's been done is to try applying an exponential amplification, which you can see indicated under the graph here, the 
amplification increases with depth to try and compensate for this damping and enhance the response from the toe. Um, all very well in theory and under <coughs> ideal conditions. Unfortunately, construction sites tend to be very noisy places. The earth itself is a noisy place when you're measuring at these levels. So when you're enhancing the toe, you're also enhancing all the rest of the geo noise. And in some cases, it, it's not helpful at all because all you see is a huge uh, number of bumps and wiggles and you have no idea which one really represents the toe. So it needs to be applied with a great deal of caution by somebody who's experienced because if you overdo the amplification, you're definitely going to mislead yourself. To try and answer some of the shortcomings, the uh, impulse response method was developed where we have a load cell built into the hammer tip. So now we can measure the force input. We're already measuring the velocity response. So we can do a network analysis and come up with the dynamic stiffness of the shaft, which is a very useful parameter, particularly if you're evaluating a large group, a large population of shafts. The response curve is analyzed in the time domain, in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. So we get more information out of it than we do out of the simple echo test, um, information which pertains to the cross section, the concrete quality, as well as the length. Because we're measuring that force, however, it's very sensitive to the condition of the shaft head. So it must be applied on clean, sound concrete. Otherwise, the concrete crumbles or distorts when you strike with a hammer and you get a false, uh, uh, inaccurate force reading, which then screws up the analysis. Still sensitive to the surrounding soils, still not good with multiple reflectors, and the same penetration depth limitation as with the impulse echo. However, with the response curve that we get, under ideal conditions, which sometimes do happen. Um, we've got the slope of the, uh, the dynamic stiffness is the slope of this early portion of the curve. The resonant peaks are from uh, a function of the depth of the reflector. The P to Q values here, the peak to trough values, are a function of the damping on the shaft, the side friction. And the phasing of those peaks from the origin is a function of the end bearing on the shaft. So under good conditions, we'll get a test result that can tell us a great deal more about the shaft and its likely behavior than the echo test. Um, even when we've got variable soils or variable cross-section, we still get usually enough of the main parameters for the test to still be useful. The dynamic stiffness, as I said, is a very useful method because um, for analyzing large populations of shafts, it's very graphic. Everybody loves a graphic uh, test result. Moving right along to try and answer the shortcomings of the previous two methods, um, the cross hole sonic log test was developed. Um, the primary limitation of the method is the fact that it needs these access tubes. Sorry. We need access tubes pre-placed in the shaft attached to the reinforcing cage before the concrete is placed so that we can lower sensors down those tubes and shoot across from one tube to the other. So we're measuring the velocity of an ultrasonic pulse or the time of flight of an ultrasonic pulse from one side to the other. The velocity of an ultrasonic pulse in concrete is a function of the modulus and density. So it's a direct guide to the quality of the, of the material. If the tubes are parallel and the concrete is uniform, as we draw these probes up the tubes, we should see a, a uniform response, a uniform time. Uh, of arrival. So we're measuring the ultrasonic pulse velocity of the concrete. The depth limitation is only the cables. Um, you know, you, you can... I've seen equipment with 500 foot cables. I've never seen anybody trying to pull 500 feet of cable out of a hole, but uh, it can be done. It's got a good horizontal range, which makes it useful for large diameter shafts. It's also used on uh, things like diaphragm walls and barrettes. You can even shoot through the joint between adjacent wall panels if you're concerned about the tightness of the quality of the joint for a, if it's a cutoff wall or something like that. As I say, it does require the access tubes. The other two methods, the impulse, impact, impulse echo sorry, and the impulse response, can be applied after the fact. If you suspect for any reason there may be an issue with the shaft, you can always go along, clean off the top, and run the test on it. With this method, you have to have the tubes in place or you've got to core it. And that too has been done, is to do a couple of core holes and shoot across between the core holes. So 
So it's, it's a, a test that really needs to be pre-planned. Typical test result is a chirp. We, we got the point at which so the uh, pulse is emitted and then it's received. So there's your time of flight, first arrival time. That's the first key piece of information. However, the rest of the waveform also carries information which is helpful, um, particularly in um, situations where you've got some, uh, either some muck on the tubes or some debonding occurring between the tube and the concrete, the signal gets very faint. So these later arrivals can be very helpful in identifying uh, the time of flight in those situations. However, you're, you're typically doing a test every two inches. So when you come up through the shaft, you end up with five or 600 of these things. How do you present those in the test result? Well, the simple answer to a lot of people was we only care about the time, first arrival time. So that's all they log. But as I said before, this other information is extremely useful under various circumstances so what we do is basically rectify the signal where each positive peak is printed as a dash, each negative peak is left as a gap. So we get this dot dash line which represents all of the timing information and some of the amplitude information that's in this. So as we come up the shaft, we then stack up these lines, one on top of the other, and we build up a vertical profile of what we've seen in the shaft. Purely incidentally, this profile was from a test shaft where we were looking at the effect of uh, free fall placement of concrete. And it was a shaft we tried to construct as badly as possible just to lay some of the myths to bed. And we actually got a very nice, dense concrete at the bottom of the hole, hence the shorter arrival time. Another advantage of the, oops, jumped. The um, advantage of the cross hole method is we can do simple tomography between the tubes. Um, if we see a glitch in the data at, say, 40 feet depth, and it's on all of the tubes, the immediate assumption is this is a massive problem across the entire shaft. Whereas in reality, those kind of problems are often around the periphery of the shaft, and the concrete in the middle is fine. How do you prove that? So with 2D tomography, you can go in there and run your test in the normal configuration with the probes parallel. You can then go back and offset the probes vertically at a known distance. I mean, if the simplest way is 45 degrees, if your tubes are two feet apart, you raise one by two feet and run the test. Then you reverse the, the offset, run the test again. And now you draw a very simple scale diagram of the shaft and you plot the data from the horizontal profile then from your angled profile in one direction, and then the angled profile in the other direction. And then when you mark out where they all intersect, that's where your issue is. So the test is capable of distinguishing between peripheral or uh, peripheral defects or lenses across the entire shaft, which none of the other methods can do. So this is a, a major asset, if you like, of the uh, cross hole test. Moving on from there is the, the gamma log, which is very popular in California for, uh, primarily they're concerned about the cover concrete because of the seismic issues. And this is the method was developed specifically to look at the cover concrete. Um, you've got a radioactive source, which is emitting photons out into the concrete. Um, due to a phenomenon called Compton scattering, those photons are zipping around all over the place. Some are getting reflected, some are getting refracted, and some are getting absorbed. Eventually, some will make their way to the receiver, the scintillometer up here, and you count the number of arrivals. It's that simple. It's done electronically, of course. You don't have to sit there actually pinging. But, uh, if you've got a high count of uh, particles arriving here, it means there weren't many of them absorbed, so you've got low-density concrete. On the other hand, if you get a low count here, then a lot of your energy is being absorbed in the concrete, which indicates that it's, it's a good high density. So it's a, it's a relative method, but um, it works within its limits. 
It's estimating the concrete density. Again, the depth is only limited by the cable. Its major limitation is its range. Um, the current configurations for this equipment typically only see about three to four inches radius around the tube. So if you've got a 10 foot diameter shaft, you need a lot of tubes around there to get any degree of confidence of what you're seeing around the outside of it. Because it's measuring density or relative density, it's very sensitive to the proximity of reinforcing steel. And so it's, uh, the, it might, the, the access tubes must be fixed very firmly to the cage, very securely. Again, because you're measuring density, you can't use or you shouldn't use a steel tube. It, it, it will work, but it will be much less sensitive than in a PVC tube. So the normal specification is to use PVC pipe, which of course is fairly bendy, especially when you've got something 100 feet deep. So it needs to be tied off every few feet to make sure it doesn't uh, wander about inside the shaft. Again, its main purpose is to be sensitive to the thickness of the cover concrete, um, but it's also sensitive to joints and ties. So with this method, it's imperative that whoever does the construction of the cage and assembles the pipes makes a note of where all the joints are, where the spacers are. Uh, California, particularly, they use a, tend to use adobe blocks on the outside of the cage as centralizers. So these will all be picked up in the test data. So if they're not documented, then you're looking at a whole bunch of glitches that make people nervous. Whereas if you've got the records there to show that there's an adobe block every 10 feet, uh, the problem goes away. So it comes an issue um, sometimes. It's if the cage centralizers get sheared off or aren't used, you get an eccentric cage, you'll get all sorts of variability in your test results. Um, that would be a nominal result. It's equally spaced from the vertical steel either side, and its zone of influence, it's three to four inches of coverage, is within the concrete. Here where the cage is eccentric, it's picking up the outside soil, so you're gonna get an artificially low reading, which is what you're looking for in terms of low cover. Uh, here it's against the steel, so you're gonna get a, a high reading. Um, problem is that Caltrans tend to use the average value for the shaft and look for anything that's two standard deviations or greater from that average. So if your average has been messed up by situations like this, it's where is the average? What number do you use? So again, it's uh, just a, 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 something to be very aware of when you're using the method. Hopefully you'll never need to use it because one of the drawbacks with it, of course, is it's radioactive. And if something goes wrong and that thing drops to the bottom of the hole, they're not gonna let you leave it there. Somehow you've gotta figure out how to fish it out or dig it out, whatever. But uh, there is a, some liability there. The other thing is it doesn't travel well because it's a radioactive source. So moving this kind of stuff interstate uh, requires a boatload of paperwork and licenses and gets very expensive very quickly. So that's it, my elevator's arrived. Okay, thanks, sir. Finally, um, we're gonna talk about a much more recent uh, integrity test method. Uh, you've seen the, uh, the ASTM numbers. Uh, this is ASMD 7949, indicating that it was uh, much more recent, and Gray Mullins can tell us all about it. Really, I am the last one, right? Uh, last and least. So, no. All right, let's see where we, where we go with this. Uh, first off, it's a brand new method. Well, brand new, starting in like 1985, but it really didn't do anything of any consequence in 2005-ish, at that time frame. Uh, but we did start doing our work at the university in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, actually, at Dan Brown's site, probably one of the first places we ever used it. But so what does it do? We call it thermal integrity profiling, you know, all different types of acronyms, trying to uh, be sensitive. Um, but it measures temperature. That's all it is. We know that the heat of hydration is a, is a big issue uh, for lots of reasons, uh, but we measure the temperature and because the temperature is so reliable to develop inside the, the concrete, uh, if it's missing, it, of course, that's going to be a problem, and we'll, we'll see that there's no concrete there. Or if there's excessive heat, then maybe we have more than we thought. So we're able to see uh, a lot of things we didn't used to be able to see. And so you see a bunch of uh, examples there uh, where we can measure the concrete cover or at least estimate it. Of course, we don't have a tape measure down there and measuring it. Um, and then at, at the end of the day, we can uh, give you the idea of the concrete quality 
if you're doing multiple tests on a, on a given program, you know what your temperature should be at a certain time. And if it's not that temperature, um, you got to figure out what happened to your mix supply. So that's when I say quality of concrete, that's in that way. Um, does it talk about this? So, so this is the type of uh, internal temperature concept that you might expect where the center most portions of the concrete are the warmest. The edges are diffusing their heat into the surrounding soils, which also warm. Uh, the surface and the bottom cool by longitudinal and radial uh, heat flow. And so if you look at this thing, uh, we call this the bell curve as it goes across it. Uh, when, when a shaft gets larger, the bell curve grows. And so we'll see a change in our profile. So you see off to the right there, we see what, what we thought would be the normal profile now has a big bulge in the middle of it. Looking at some field data, we see normal end conditions where the ends are cooled from, from the air and from the, from the bottom, as well as we see that bulge right there in the middle. I'm going to come back to this slide uh, in a moment. The other thing that we can see is cage movement. If the cage slides off to one side or the other, one side of the shaft is going to get warmer measurements and the other side will be cooler measurements. And, <laughs> and because the bell is largely linear in that region, simple, simple averaging of your measurements all the way around gives you that solid black line there that I'm showing to be the average shape of the shaft. Um, so given that, let me back up to the, uh, the previous image. This is field data. And if you look there, there are four readings, four temperature readings, and they're all stacked right on top of each other. Everybody can kind of see that, right? This cage is not moving. It's absolutely centralized in this, in this hole, pretty well, whole way down, except for the region of the bulge. Well, the bulge isn't uniform. There's a couple of bad things that happen when we have a bulge. One, your spacers don't touch anything anymore, so they can't be centralized. And secondly, you can't control the bulge to be you know, the same size on all, on all sides here. So if the equal and opposite temperature changes are not equal and opposite from the average, then your bulge is eccentric to one side or the other. And you see here, I think it's the pink curve there, tube two is showing that we have more of a bulge in that direction. So this kind of intuitive uh, look at the data is, is pretty important. When you do look at eccentricity here, you will see that equal and opposite measurements are in fact occurring. And it, when you look at it, you can actually tell if the cage is going northwest, southwest, or whatever direction the cage is actually moved. Um, also, if you look closely, you see that the top is much warmer than the bottom. Well, that makes sense because they use a surface casing in that region. And this is where we like to have all field information as well. I, I like to refer to Bernie's uh, paper where he called it uh, analysis collateral, I believe. Um, you want to use every piece of information in that field log to verify the signals that you're seeing. And what are we seeing here? We're seeing casing down to about uh, 30 feet, and sure enough, they, that's, that was the condition for here. And everywhere else you see the eccentricity, the cage just got away. By the way, in the casing region, it's pretty common to have the cage uh, offset because it's oversized. It's, uh, again, the uh, the spacers don't touch the sidewalls correctly. At the very top, the contractor will try to get it as centered as possible, but, but just within a few feet, it'll, it'll go off, off center. When we look at individual concrete trucks that are poured for drilled shafts, um, a good inspection program goes in and looks and predicts what would be the diameter of each shaft, each uh, truck poured, because I was able to tape the measurement of how high the concrete went between trucks, and so I just back calculate what cross-sectional area must have been, at least the average area for that particular truck. Pretty simple measurement. So good inspection logs would show this. Uh, what we're seeing here is a blue line straight up, which is, a, is my design, design shape of this shaft with a surface casing. And then the individual trucks showed that, oh, I had some pretty large overpours, and that's the, the pinkish looking curves there as well. Turns out that when we compare those measurements to our average temperature measurements for that particular shaft, we see a one-to-one -one correlation with the temperature, the average temperature at any given depth and the actual uh, shaft diameter. So this is the mechanism by which we use to convert temperature to radius and then radius gives us cover and also then gives us cage movement as well. Once you know this one-to-one -one relationship, then I can superimpose that constant. It becomes a constant value, temperature to radius constant, 
I multiply it by every single measurement that I have on the shaft, and each tube gets its own profile shape. Um, and then if I superimpose onto that the cage measurements and the, the true shaft dimensions, I can see where this cage might be touching the sidewalls or how much cover I have. In this particular case, I had at least three tubes touching the sidewall. Now, this was a method shaft, and when a contractor gets onto the first site, or on you know, the site for the first time and they do their method shab. There's lots of stuff they're figuring out. Shortly thereafter, these things go away. As soon as we show them this data the first time, they fix everything. And usually we have very few problems later on in the project. Um, but because we have this capability of mapping to each tube their dimensions, then we can give you kind of a 3D rendering of what the shaft must be. And as you look at this, the, the uh, three and a half foot diameter line is struck down the side there and you can see all the places where it uh, is larger than the, the radius that we're expecting and where it's also smaller. So from a limitation standpoint, I mean, obviously we're gonna tell you a lot more than, than you may want to know, but you do have to plan. Um, yes, you have to have tubes in there if you wanna use probes because uh, there are different w methods of using it. If you want to use uh, embedded wire sensors, then those have to be tied into the cage for construction. Um, it's easy to break a wire. It's also easy to get a, a tube full of concrete or a clog somehow. So um, these are ways that you wouldn't get reliable information. That aside, um, if you're just doing qualitative analysis, then it's just like any other method we use. We look at it and we say, okay, how does it compare to the rest of the shaft? Uh, that's wonderful. Quantitatively, you need to be able to convert it with accurate concrete measurements. And sometimes the inspector has to just climb up and look inside and say how much concrete's left in the truck. Or maybe the driver looks and says, oh, I've got two and a half yards left in here. It's funny how sometimes on our inspection logs, they estimate the concrete to the nearest tenth of a yard I'm not really sure how the truck does that. The other thing is uh, sometimes when concrete trucks back uphill, if it's a steep hill and they're backing up to place, concrete gets left in the truck if it just can't come out when it's on that steep incline. And so they assume they placed all nine yards out of that, but they didn't. They put eight and a half or something along those lines. So there can be errors in garbage in, garbage out kind of analogy when it comes to uh, concrete volumes. So I think at this point we're... Thanks, sir. Thanks questions. Which brings us back to you. Any questions about integrity testing methods? Questions you have been... Go ahead. Question for both of you. Um, can you comment on the relationship between an NDT indication of an anomaly and an actual structural problem and how current acceptance criteria, uh, how well current criteria address that flexibility? Bernie. Yeah, this has been a bone of contention for a long time. Not hearing it? No. Maybe my voice is just clean. <laughs> yeah, this has been a bone of contention for a long time. Um, dating back to, I want to say 2006, um, Yoram Amir, uh, Israeli practitioner, came up with the idea that there should be three categories here. Um, the first is an anomaly, because you don't know what it is, it's just something funny in the data. So it could be you messed the test up, it could be that your equipment wasn't functioning properly. So, you know, it's an anomaly. When you've gone through your equipment, your procedures, and you're satisfied that it is in fact genuine data from something in the shaft, then it's imperfect, it's a flaw. But you're not at that point in a position to call it a defect, because you don't know whether it's going to affect the shaft significantly or not. So. Once you get to that stage, the structural engineer and the geotech have got to get together, figure out where it is in the shaft, how extensive it is, and whether or not it's likely to affect either the capacity or the durability of the shaft. The shaft doesn't have to be perfect to work perfectly well. So you know, it's, it's not a decision that should be in the testing report. It's something that needs to be decided by the structural engineer after a thorough evaluation. Gray, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think, yes, I do, of course. Um, he, he's dead on with this. The whole concept of a, an acceptance criteria is really a, a marriage between the structural engineer and the testing firm. Uh, it's wise at the onset of a project, 
for the structural to come in and say, I will tolerate uh, a certain reduction in radius. Now, for obviously with the thermal measurements when we're giving radius, now this plays right into structural capacity. Um, how much radius reduction are, can you tolerate uh, from a structural standpoint? Will it have a geotechnical effect? Maybe it'll have a geotechnical effect, but that generally isn't the one thing that is uh, dictating the concrete uh, integrity. So acceptance has to, at least uh, if for the state of Florida, for instance, we have three criteria. One is the cage needs to be centralized to a re within a reasonable degree, one and a half inches or so. Uh, you cannot have a reduction of radius that uh, impinges on the structural capacity. The structural engineer has to set that at the onset. Uh, one project that I'm aware of was a three quarter inch reduction was acceptable, but no more. And so we didn't have to go any time we, we found a problem. Uh, we just immediately knew this. Uh, and then of course there's cover. Uh, and we're concerned about marine environments and whether or not the corrosion will occur if we don't have enough cover. So we do all these calculations uh, from the material science crew and, and they tell us that we need at least four and a half inches of cover. So if we can maintain our concentric cage and our cover and maintain the structural integrity or the capacity, then we're happy. But again, this is case by case. And it's generally very rare that the structural aspect of it uh, is the key. We generally size foundations for the geotechnical capacity. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about, uh, two questions about the uh, thermal uh, technique. Um, first, uh, being involved in concrete plants and um, for a long time, the uh, material concrete is a natural, uh, natural product which varies a lot. Um, not only the, uh, the ingredients, uh, the aggregates varies, but also the mix is not a constant. Um, how you deal with uh, natural uh, variation uh, in the test? <laughs> Natural variation in the sense of uh, hydrating warmth. Second question I have and refer, refers to the uh, presentation of Oliver earlier today. Uh, he presented measuring of, uh, of warmth in time, and we see the change of the distribution of warmth in time, um, and how that means that suggests that there are will be different testing results uh, depending on the moment you do the uh, thermal tests. Uh, related to the start of the uh, production of the panel. So, two questions about the natural variation uh, of, of the concrete, uh, the influence of the concrete itself on the measurements, and secondly, the effect of, of time. Great. Okay, so uh, those are kind of the, the big questions we would always get in, in thermals. The concrete varies, it does vary truck to truck. A truck could be four hours behind another truck. Within a given truck, I'm going to say the concrete is uniform. I'm assuming it's spun enough by the time it's gotten there. Uh, hopefully it hasn't spun too much, uh, but it's fairly uniform. So we tend not to do analysis on, and we, I always push people away from doing analysis too early, meaning that if, even if I've used wire data and I can take it on every 15 minute interval from time zero, um, I would like to see the trucks all come to a relatively similar maturation. So uh, peak temperature is kind of a nice time to be doing testing or a little thereafter. So all the trucks have kind of come to the same temperature. I didn't show uh, the natural hydration time frame, although Oliver did show uh, the hydration. There's a flattening of the time temperature curve when you get to the top of the peak. And we'd like to have all the trucks have gotten into that peak at the time that you've done your analysis so that we don't have an age differential amongst trucks, at least not a significant age difference that, that changes their temperature. Um, if two trucks do show up and one is significantly different, I had one at the uh, in Minneapolis where it was supposed to be an SCC mix throughout, the last truck was someone's sidewalk. I, I have no idea where that concrete came from. It was a completely different truck. So that's not necessarily a defect, I think that comes back to what, what Bernie's talking about. It's an anomaly. Something's not quite right. The data was collected correctly, so I'm going to put it into the flaw region. Uh, at that time, they need to go core it and find out why these two concretes are different. So um, it's been flagged. 
I'm going to call it bad. We need to go figure out why it's, uh, the measurements have come off wrong. The second question, I believe, deals more with the uh, surrounding environment. Uh, the rate of hydration, the, the rate of energy production, is on the order of five to ten times faster than the soil can dissipate it. And that's why we see a temperature rise in the first place. The soils cannot pull it away that quickly. However, in Oliver's world, he's got a very dissipating environment, which is so cold that it's going to pull any kind of energy that we can. He's only getting 70 degrees. I know you said that that was hot. To us, that is like <laughs> freezing cold concrete. I mean, our concrete arrives at 90, um, and then it goes up from there. So um, you're in a very unusual circumstances, and I'd love to look at your data with you later. I was going to come and see you about that. But um, so. In conditions where you have variable uh, ground conditions, we also get this in ger geothermal areas, you need to know what your temperature profile was of the soil to start with. And then you can correct your data to reflect, the, in your case, you had a linear trend from the uh, permafrost down, where it was linearly increasing in temperature, and then it rolled off at the end. You did have a few little anomalies in there, uh, whether it was cut in, in perfectly cohesive, icy soils or not, no, you had a flaw, or not a flaw, you had something wrong there, or maybe a few bulges. But it's just different from the rest of the shaft. And then above that, it changed again, because now you're in a completely different environment. So having the external conditions uh, vary as drastically as, as uh, geothermal and permafrost, very rare. The rest of the world, generally the rate is so fast compared to its dissipation, we don't even see it until after peak two, three days later uh, after peak, then we'll start to pick up soil stratification in the profiles. It's kind of interesting. We don't use that information, but it is possible to get it at. Okay. There was a question back there. Uh, two questions on CSL testing. Uh, the first one is, what, what's your opinion on using PVC pipes to do the testing? And the second, uh, do you consider the measuring the quality of the concrete outside the cage and measuring top to bottom limitations? Well, the uh, PVC tube issue has been around for a long time. Um, coming back to the heat of hydration of the concrete, especially in a large diameter shaft, uh, the concrete heats up, obviously, the tubes get warm, they soften a little bit. As the concrete cools down, PVC tends to lose its bond to the concrete, so it shortens the time window that you've got to perform the test. That doesn't happen with a steel pipe, so steel is the preferred material. Um, Caltrans, as I said, use the PVC because they, they're running the gamma test, and if the gamma test comes up with an issue, they will often go and try and do uh, cross-hole testing in the same tubes, and they've had mixed success with that. So it's... Uh, there's a reason for using steel instead of PVC. And remind me your other question, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, cross hole doesn't look outside the cage. Um, if the tubes are properly placed, it will tell you whether or not you've got a soft bottom. Um, but it means the tubes have got to be extended to the bottom. What we're seeing is a lot of specs where they're concerned about corrosion and they want the cage and the tubes held six inches off the bottom of the hole. So you can't do anything about it. You can't see the bottom of the hole in, in that situation. And the test was never intended to look outside the tubes, uh, outside the cage, although several um, areas, several agencies have tried putting the tubes on the outside of the cage to help. But when you look at that from a geometric point of view, you're shooting from tube to tube. So even though the tube's on the outside of the cage, the pulse path is almost all inside the cage. It really doesn't gain you anything. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I wanted to address the adequacy of PIP on auger cast piles, um, particularly when you have, uh, I'll say, non-uniform subsurface conditions and you might have bulges as you come into bugs and limestone or something like that, and then CSL might be a better choice to evaluate anomalies in all cast piles. Great. Okay. Um, 
we just finished a study. It was a joint task with uh, the Department of Transportation of Florida as well as the DFI, and we looked at use of thermal integrity um, for the measurements uh, or integrity verification. Um, the state of Florida is pushing towards use of uh, auger cast in place files for uh, bridge foundations, and it might happen very soon, actually, uh, which is kind of surprising, actually. But um, is it effective? Yes. Thermal easily can measure the shape of the shaft uh, using the exact same concepts as we use uh, for drilled shafts. There's no difference with that, with regards to that. It does pick up the bulges, it picks up the necks. Uh, the problem comes with whether or not you're, you can get enough information, are you going to have opposing information, like do you have a cage? And so if you have a cage, you have opposing temperature measurements that you possibly could get from either side. And so in those cases, you can verify the, the centralized nature of, of a rod. But if it's a single rod, you don't have that. And that's a real common foundation element, just a single rod. So the question is, uh, or the, the you know, million dollar question for us is, is the bar pulling away from the center and therefore it's getting cooler or is it getting cooler because I truly have a neck at those locations? Um, so we look at general trends to see if we can see a linear trend, but you know, a, a long bar is the same as a wet piece of spaghetti. And so it can oscillate and go through many different conditions. So it does, it's not a cut and dry plug in the information, and, and I think we were talking about whether or not things could be automated. Uh, most of the thermal analysis can be automated. This is one where you, you might need to use some, some common sense and look at the information to say this looks like a linear trend away from the center. So uh, it's totally possible, but you have to um, be careful that there could, there could be those kinds of errors. Anything you want to add, Bernie? Uh, only that I've been asked the question many times, do I think thermal integrity profiling is going to replace cross-hole testing? Is it better? Is it worse? Whatever. They're two different tests. They're measuring different things. And depending how desperate you are to find out all about your shaft, you might want to do both. In many circumstances, that's happened. So don't confuse the fact that you know, one is replacing the other. They're different tests, different purposes, and sometimes you want to use both of them. And I think that's a perfect conclusion for this whole thing. Like I said, whether it's slow testing or integrity testing, there is no one perfect test that can replace everything else. So another test in the toolbox, figure out what you're really after, what application you have, and pick the right horse for the course. And with that, I want to thank you for staying here so long. I want to thank the four panelists for preparing their presentations and answering your, your questions. Thank you very much. much longer, but I would like to congratulate Gerald for just organizing a wonderful panel and uh, engaging great panelists to contribute their experience uh, gained over many years of uh, successful and sometimes challenging jobs. So thank you very much, and thank you all for participating in the Superpile, two great days of excellent uh, presentations and discussions. Uh, I think we all should thank the DFI staff for doing such a wonderful job over and over again. So. Thank you very much. And the next super pile is in 2020. We'll be in early June in St. Louis, so maybe we'll see you all there. Uh, please do be on the lookout for call for abstracts and other information coming down the line. Okay, you're free. Maybe we'll see you all at the bar. Enjoy. Safe travels back, and we'll see you later.